Before I go into uh, my final set of slides, I want to go back to the biofuels uh, discussion, which I uh, skipped over before. We did the first couple of slides here. And what I want to talk about is uh, thermochemical processing of biofuels, basically biofuels to liquid and uh, what that entails. And um, basically, uh, uh, the heart of it is biomass gasification. And um, so uh, they're probably on the order of 100 different varieties of uh, gasifiers out there, but they fall into uh, one of three categories, a, a moving bed, entrained flow, and, and fluidized bed. And, and mainly what we're looking at here um, uh, is either entrained flow or fluidized beds are the ones that are uh, considered for biomass gasification. I mean, there's other ways, thermochemical ways to uh, process biomass. You can do uh, pyrolysis and, and the like, but uh, I, I think uh, the biomass, uh, the gasification route is the one that's looked at the most. So I want to just talk about a, a few major points here. Um, and um, sometimes, uh, and people are working on plasma gasification uh, also, uh, but that plasma gasification is still uh, um, expensive, more expensive and uh, uh, not as um, advanced as the others. Um, and when we're, when we're well, when we're making uh, biofuels, uh, we could be making drop-in fuels, or we could be making um, uh, things like hydrogen. So. Let's take a look at the difference between the two major gasifiers, uh, the entrained flow and the fluidized bed. Um, the, the, the ones that were uh, built in the power industry, there have been a handful over the years, they've been mainly uh, the entrained flow. So these are the bigger gasifiers, and, and, and they were using coal. So moving to biomass causes some trouble. But uh, so. The here, here, here you see the particle size. You have a smaller particle size uh, in the entrained flow versus the fluidized bed. Uh, this actually runs under higher pressure uh, than, than the fluidized beds, also much higher temperatures than the fluidized bed. Uh, these can be fairly small, where these uh, pretty much have to be fairly big scale uh, 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 to go. Uh, these, though, when you gasify, you have uh, nearly 100% conversion. High temperature uh, uh, really uh, helps that. Um, here, you don't have 100% conversion, and, and it just depends on how much. Uh, and the syngas here is very clean. Where here, you can, you contains methane and things they call tars. These are aromatics and other hydrocarbons uh, that come out. So if you're going to actually move this and do the Fischer-Tropes process, you're going to have to clean up the tires before you uh, go. These, uh, the drain flow do come with a higher unit cost. So um, when we did a project, we looked at both of these and tried to understand uh, which was better. But one of the problems uh, with the entrain flow gasifier is, um, you know, uh, it has a short residence time, and, but therefore you need to have uh, uh, your particle size has to be small and it has to be fairly uh, uniform. Uh, with biomass, you really can't get there. Right? What I highlighted here in, in, in yellow is yeah, if you wanted to really pulverize your biomass to get it down to that small size, the energy to do that will probably uh, be equal to the energy you have in the biomass. So that's really not an alternative. And so what people uh, uh, do is they talk about torrefaction of the biomass. And torrefaction is really uh, a, a pyrolysis process um, uh, that will basically uh, take off some of the gases and leave you with a, a, a you know, a, a, a sort of like a char that, that's similar to um, coal and uh, also has removed a lot of the moisture. So if you're gonna if you're gonna use an entrained flow, then torrefaction becomes a uh, probably a, a must in the pre-processing. So 
we did a project uh, uh, in the 2010s that looked at uh, biomass to liquid pathways. Uh, we spent about five years on the project uh, uh, looking at different things. And what we did, you know, when you want to convert the biomass to a fuel, and as I said, this is, you know, one of the major options uh, that we said uh, uh, to, to take, you know, to, re to replace uh, the carbon-containing fuels, the other options being uh, uh, offsets or uh, um, uh, 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 electric fuels. So you need to prepare feed preparation, uh, which if it's in train flow will be a torrefaction. You can maybe do other feed preparations that aren't as intensive uh, if you're using a um, fluidized bed. Uh, then you have to do the gasification then when you come out, you want to do uh, the water gas shift um, to, to get, um, to basically uh, create a syngas, depending on where you're going, uh, how much shifting you do uh, to get the right ratio. If you're going to fish or tropes, you need a, a ratio of uh, carbon monoxide to hydrogen. Uh, I forget exactly what it, what it is, but you need to get the right ratio there. You remove your acid gases, so this is where you remove your CO2. And uh, then you do your fissure tropes if you want to uh, do liquid fuels. And if you want to do hydrogen, you can do a, a pressure swing adsorption uh, type process. The, we did, uh, I'm going to show you one thing. We did a, ref, we did a Kate reference case here uh, using a train, I'm sorry, using a fluidized bed gasifier. We were using uh, wood chips, and uh, uh, the, the biomass we were using was lob belly pine. This is used a lot in the literature because it's a fast-growing uh, tree. And the size we were doing were 3,700 barrels of uh, liquid fuel a day. And I just wanted to show the carbon balance when you sort of look at these uh, processes. So this axis here is uh, grams of CO2 per megajoule. So what, what we look at here, if you're looking at conventional diesel, so this will be a drop-in for diesel fuel. Uh, conventional diesel has uh, 92 uh, grams of CO2 per megajoule. So you're up here. <coughs> and if, if we're using uh, uh, biomass, eventually, um, we have this much biomass here, which is, more, which is more energy than we would have in the fuel because we have losses along the way. So we have carbon losses in the biomass production. Uh, so this is maybe from fertilizers or, or whatever you put on the, uh, the biomass. Uh, you, when you harvest it, you lose some biomass. Um, uh, then, uh, and then there's energy used in the, in the harvest, uh, probably fossil energies, uh, or some of the equipment used in harvesting. Uh, there's infield logistics losses. Oh, we lost what that is. <laughs> if you store the biomass, uh, you, you lose some in the storage. And then you have the, the actual plant itself um, here. And so here we have um, a lot of CO2 coming out. Some of that we can um, capture. So if, if we capture the CO2, this is how much CO2 uh, we capture. And we come out over here, uh, and we have a negative emission with this biofuel of about minus 150 gram CO2 per megajoule, which is a, a big uh, difference between plus 92 for the diesel if we don't do carbon capture, we actually have a little extra energy to export some uh, um, carbon-free energy. This is fuel transportation. And then, uh, once again, when we burn, whoops, I should say, this is what we give off when we burn, so I, I misspoke. So this is about minus 90 um, here, and this would be about zero. So both of them are better than uh, burning it, but uh, you can see, uh, on the biomass to liquid, uh, how that goes. Now, once again, the question comes up, 
um, we're emitting, we're still emitting a lot of CO2. Uh, in the case of the, of the CCS, so say here we're at minus 90, uh, and here say there it's minus 270, we're still emitting about 100, and, 100 uh, grams of CO2 per megajoule uh, uh, when we're doing it. Eventually that will grow back, but it won't grow back immediately. So uh, biofuels uh, are the same thing that we talked about with um, uh, burning biomass in a power plant is the temporal uh, uh, thing. But based on our study, what we found was that you can use either fluid eyes, bed gasifiers, or entrained flow gasifiers um, uh, to produce these biofuels. Um, but, you know, so far, uh, biomass gasification is still not a, a, a very mature technology. It, it still has issues, but you, you can do it. Um, uh, I mean, if, if we were going to go that way, I'm sure the technology would improve quite a bit. And what we found, we thought going with fluid eye beds gasifiers would be a little better than in train flow. Uh, one problem with biomass, once again, it doesn't travel that well. And so you'd like to have the biomass close to uh, your facility, a processing facility. Some people say, uh, you know, uh, 50 miles or so. And so uh, there's, if you, if it's not necessarily a lot of biomass there. So that's a better fit with the fluidized bed. You can take biomass long distances. They are taking bio, they are pelletizing biomass, shipping it to Europe from uh, the Southeast United States to use in power generation, say uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, so you can sh do it, but that's, you know, you have the pre-processing. The pelletizing takes out a lot of the water, makes it a little easier to uh, ship. And uh, if you were gonna do torrefaction, once again, then you can ship it. Uh, longer distances, but um, the doing torrefaction in the field in a lot of places uh, is not necessarily that easy. So um, biofuels, at least thermochemical processing, is a possibility. Uh, the government, you know, when we did this project, the government had um, credits for advanced biofuels basically uh, they're worried about ethanol made from cellulosic, I'm sorry, from uh, grains, and they wanted cellulosic biomass, so made from um, uh, like wood or, or, or other things, but not, uh, not from corn. And uh, they have pretty good incentives, and yet uh, very few uh, projects were able to claim those incentives because of the difficulty uh, of making cellulosic biomass and into a fuel. So if we are going to go to biofuels, uh, at least today, it looks like the biological approach is still um, uh, the first. But if we really want to scale it up, we're going to have to figure out how to do the thermochemical approaches, which, you know, goes along, you know, thermochemical processing is part of uh, the whole combustion regime. So that's, uh, just wanted to share that before I head on to the last uh, section here. Any questions? So, we'll talk a little about policy. Actually, it's a little more than just policy. It's um, sort of try to put where, where we are in perspective here. And um, I started out the first day talking about uh, the climate treaty, uh, the Rio Convention, uh, the Earth Summit back in 1992. And at the Earth Summit, the, uh, in, in the Framer Convention, the objective was to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That's since been translated into uh, trying to keep it to 1.5 degrees C temperature rise, uh, definitely under 2 degrees C uh, temperature rise. And so the question is, how are we doing? What's happened? And basically, 
31 years now since the, since the, the world countries agreed to this language. And if we look here uh, at the United States, uh, our energy use uh, from 1992 to 2019 has gone up from uh, a little over 80 up to 100. Uh, the, the fossil fuel use has increased 5%. We have seen uh, non-carbon energy sources uh, grow at a faster rate than, than the 5% we see from fossil, but yet the share of fossil energies only go down from 86 to 80%. And we need to drive that, not necessarily to zero, but we need to drive that to 20% or 10% uh, to really hit those goals. And you can see uh, time is running out with our carbon budgets. Uh, at 2 degrees C, our carbon budget, uh, I forget exactly, you know, we maybe have uh, 20 or 30 years uh, before we... Um, uh, exceed that two degrees C, well, maybe 40 years before we exceed that two degrees C. Is the world doing any better? And the answer is no. Uh, they've, the world, we've gone up 66% in our use of fossil energy. Uh, we have come down once again, only 84%. So you see the uh, non-fossil has grown faster than fossil, but uh, non-fossil is not even growing fast enough to absorb all new energy uses, let alone uh, back out fossil fuels. So policy is not really working. Uh, people are optimistic still that uh, things will go better in the future, but uh, the jury's still out on that. Uh, even if we do do a lot better, it's probably not, it, we're almost surely going to overshoot the two degrees C uh, target. Once again, that's why people talk about negative emissions so much. Uh, but that's the state that we're in. Um, so what type of policies can you do to encourage decarbonization? And there's several general categories here. Um, uh, the, the two big ones are market pull or technology push. Um, the US government is really focused on technology push. Those are a lot what I call the carrots the other day, supporting R&D programs uh, and giving money support in terms of direct subsidies or tax credits. The market pull is to create markets. Uh, how do you do that? You can set a price on carbon. You can restrict emissions, uh, such as setting portfolio standards, uh, um, cafe standards in cars, you know, sending the fuel miles on a car is an example of a, of a portfolio standard. Um, but those are sticks, and uh, po politically, at least in the U.S., sticks are harder to come by. The Europeans uh, are a little better at imposing those than we are. Um, what are some uh, policy model uh, things? So carrots, uh, lump sum grants, and uh, we see this, and there's money in some of the new policies to do that. That's to like, support a big demonstration project, uh, paying uh, 10, 20, maybe 30% of the capital cost of it. Tax credits, and I'm going to come back to that because this is really uh, where a lot of the policy has come. Uh, and for carbon capture and storage, it's what's called the 45Q tax credits. They created some tax credits for hydrogen. Those are called 45V. Those numbers come from the part of the U.S. tax code um, where those tax credits uh, reside. Whoops. You have government financing uh, uh, and loan guarantees uh, for projects. Sticks, carbon pricing, uh, we do see it in some places. California has it. As I mentioned, uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the Northeast here. Uh, has some carbon pricing. That's very modest, though. Europe has the emissions trading system, and that's up to <coughs> approximately 100 euros a ton. Uh, so that's fairly significant. Uh, portfolio standards, um, that's, uh, as I said, uh, you can look at the 
uh, fuel economies for a car as a portfolio standard, saying you have to hit this standard. They have portfolio standards on appliances, uh, emissions performance standards. This is the EPA is going to be putting out some uh, performance standards for power plants um, uh, probably fairly shortly. Uh, whether they stick or not, uh, once again, has to get through our political process. But uh, uh, that will, uh, if they do go through, that will require putting carbon capture or substitute or, or, or blending uh, with hydrogen at uh, our coal and our uh, natural gas plants. That would be a fairly significant uh, change, and that would, if it comes in, then the companies have about 10 years to implement it. Um, so let's talk about the specific policies. So, so 45Q, um, what that is, is um, that's been around a while, but the recent bills have increased it. Um, right now, uh, the level is if you put CO2 into the ground, um, you will get uh, $85 a ton. If you're putting into a geologic uh, formation and it's come from an anthropogenic source, it's just a, there's a minimum quantity you have to reach, but um, it, it's fairly low level. Uh, so if you do it from a power plant put in the ground, you'll get $85 a ton. If it goes, if you do it for enhanced oil recovery, you'll get $60 a ton. If you do it from a, um, a negative emissions plant, basically a direct air capture plant, they're going to give you $180 per ton. And that sounds like a lot, but as you saw in the last lecture, the cost of, of generating from a direct air capture plant uh, is fairly significant. Um, in the UK, they have something called contract for differences, and that doesn't apply just to carbon capture, but to uh, uh, all different low carbon technologies in the electricity system. And what that's saying is we know your cost of generating electricity from your technology is more than the market price, but we'll guarantee you a certain price for your electricity from your technology. If the market price is below that, we'll pay the difference. So you do, that's the, where the term comes from, contract for differences between your cost and the market price. Um, so that's uh, uh, their method to try to uh, increase uh, low carbon technologies. Norway is doing direct subsidies. I mentioned the Northern Lights project. Uh, also, uh, Longship is basically, uh, Northern Lights is part of the Longship project. Um, and what uh, that's doing is the government's paying a lot of the funding and building up the infrastructure for those projects. So these are some examples of, of what's going on um, to sort of encourage uh, carbon capture and other low carbon technologies. I haven't talked much about cost, and uh, I think uh, important to give you at least a little range. And um, it's important to understand, in the literature you read a lot of cost numbers, and this is not just carbon capture, but it's for um, all sorts of technologies. And you got to remember, there's never one number, but costs are a range. Um, it's not like going to the supermarket and buying a loaf of bread. Uh, the cost number is indicative of a specific plant in a specific location at a specific point in time. Uh, what we've had in the last three years, we've had significant inflation, uh, cost of capital for projects like carbon capture or even renewables have gone up 20 to 30 percent on capital cost uh, in just those few years. Um, so that's why I say it's, it's not just the location, but it's also uh, the time that you're doing it. Um, and if you don't have a context, these numbers aren't very useful. So what, what is it? What are the boundary limits of the cost estimate? If we go into the direct air or, or the yeah, direct air capture literature, a lot of times they'll give cost, but they don't include the whole system. They don't include compression. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, what are the fuel costs you're paying? 
uh, a big difference. If you're, if you're doing something with natural gas in the U.S., it's a heck of a lot cheaper than doing with natural gas in Europe, and even a lot cheaper than, and that's even cheaper than doing with natural gas in Asia. Um, what's the cost of capital? How much are you going to pay? Uh, we, once again, we've seen that change a lot in the last few years. Uh, with the uh, inflation, we've seen the uh, discount rate go up by the Federal Reserve. That increases your cost of borrowing, your cost of capital. Where's the plant being built? Uh, costs vary geographically quite a bit. Uh, is it based on gross or net CO2 captured? Um, these are just a few examples. So you always have to have a context of, of what you're doing. That said, I'm going to just give some where I see some general numbers are. And I'm given what here is called an avoided cost. So that's really equivalent to a net, net capture cost, not gross capture. So when you have these high purity um, things like ammonia and ethanol, and this does include transport, compression, transport, and storage, generally you can do that for less than $50 a ton uh, of CO2 avoided. And that's why we've seen a lot of these, uh, as I said, the uh, number we see for 45Q tax credits is about $85 a ton uh, if it's going uh, in geologic formations. And so you can see that's why uh, a lot of the projects we see are focused on these type of uh, sources. If we go more into the loot sources where the power plants are, I think ultimately that range will be $50 to $100 a ton. I think today it's a little over $100 a ton because you got first mover cost. We haven't developed supply chains. You go to a supplier, it's a one of a kind thing that's much more expensive than the supplier has made a, a number of these and just replicates another copy of it. Um, and then negative emissions, which uh, I showed in the last session uh, and I gave numbers. The BEX, we think uh, uh, about $200 a ton avoided. and. Uh, DAC, uh, uh, maybe on the order of $1,000 a ton avoided. I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide uh, the project pipeline from the uh, Global CCS Institute. And uh, we can see here, we remember on the graph we saw it, it declined a lot uh, from a uh, peak in about 2011. Uh, down here into 2017, and then we've seen this really major steep increase. And as I said, there are different levels. So this top level here is early development. So what do I call early development? It's basically a press release can be early development. But we still have a lot in advanced development, and this means they're actually uh, working on it. It could be uh, a lot of these may have... Um, deed studies uh, going on, but they have not taken a, what they call a final investment decision. Uh, the final investment decisions where they have everything in front of them and say, do we go or not go, is when they have their financing all lined up. Uh, and that takes time. You got to, in this stage, you got to get the design, you got to get the permits, you got to get the financing. So this takes quite a few years, but these projects are actually have serious work going on serious money being spent in their development. We have some in construction, and then we have some operational. Um, here, uh, once again, what we see here is uh, the same thing. So we have about 30 plants operational. I mentioned we had about 40 million tons per year going in the ground. Uh, we have another 11 in construction. Uh, which were another 10 million tons of CO2 going in the ground, and quite a few in advanced development um, here. We've had a couple projects that have operated and suspended. Petronova is one of those that actually may get resurrected. As I said, um, it has a buyer you know, that wants to restart it. Uh, the other one that was suspended was the Insula project I showed you. So. These numbers are actually very encouraging if, they can, if we can really move these into the pipeline and turn them uh, from blue to red and, and get more in operation. And as I say, a big driver is uh, the funding 
coming from the bills here in the U.S. And, and in Europe, they're making funding available also. Another thing to look at uh, on how things are going, once again, from the Global CCS Institute, is in the Paris Agreement, uh, countries have to give their uh, uh, um, how much emissions reduction and tell how they're going to make them. And so the question is, do they mention carbon capture and storage and the, what they call NDCs, uh, nationally, uh, let me see if I remember what it is, uh, national, nationally declared commitments for uh, CO2 reduction. And the dark blue is basically saying these these countries specifically mentioned CCS as part of their plan for emissions reduction. Uh, the red says they don't, and the uh, white, either there's no data uh, on them. So uh, you can see um, maybe three quarters of the country, countries that uh, are submitting these plans have carbon capture and storage uh, as part of the plan. So what's driving carbon capture and storage in the U.S. today. As I mentioned, I think the real big one is the um, 45Q tax credits. Uh, these I already mentioned these numbers here uh, earlier. Uh, and uh, the uh, infrastructure funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed um, uh, early on in the Biden administration, I think in uh, 2020. Uh, and that had um, money to, to build out infrastructure uh, uh, in, uh, in the plan. It, this also increased, uh, it had an increase in the 45Q tax credits, which got an extra boost uh, uh, later on. Uh, state programs, there's a low carbon fuel standard in California for $200 a ton of CO2. So, um, if you, if you uh, uh, do carbon capture and storage, um, uh, like if you have an ethanol, uh, whether it's being used is if you like have an ethanol plant and that eth you actually have to have the fuel shipped to California. So you have an ethanol plant, which is a biofuel, which they consider, well, they have rules, but they consider at least part of it carbon free and you mix it with gasoline if that brings down the emission level of the gasoline to a certain level, you qualify for this low carbon fuel standard. So if you ship that ethanol to California, you can qualify for this. And uh, so these ethanol plants that do carbon capture and storage uh, are low carbon and can qualify for this. And so that's one other thing driving the market. Stakeholder pressure on large companies, You've probably seen that in the news, the pressure, uh, especially the oil companies, to decarbonize. All of the major oil companies have significant programs in carbon capture and storage, both in funding research internally and externally, as well as buying up uh, other companies. Um, cash from technology companies, a lot of this is going to um, uh, carbon dioxide removal technologies, but uh, the Microsofts, the Googles of the world uh, are spending money. They want to say on their website, I'm carbon neutral, and that's why they buy up a lot of these um, uh, credits uh, on negative emissions. Uh, it's, it's funding a lot of the direct air capture uh, work. Um, and finally, the growing realization that we can no longer afford to ignore climate change, um, whether it's looking outside at the sky today uh, from the wildfires, um, or if it's a, a big storm that comes, uh, people, people are, you know, are seeing, uh, are seeing of impacts of climate change. Sometimes people believe it's climate change, sometimes they don't, but uh, the, um, the, um, uh, the weather's really getting worse. You talk to the insurance companies, uh, they certainly believe it's climate change related. Uh, if you have uh, a house in Florida, I have two sisters that live in Florida, and their insurance rates are going through the roof. Uh, a major insurance company in California has pulled out because of the wildfires. Um, so all of this, you know, we're, we're seeing it come home to roost uh, already. And 
You would think that would move us to action even faster. Uh, I, it's uh, still, still there's a lot of people that don't quite believe it. Um, I think one of the biggest things that have happened over the past few years in trying to implement this is the idea of hubs. And what a hub is, is a, is a concentration of sources and sinks. So you try to um, build storage locations so you can pool all your, a, a, a lot of emissions there. So if someone wants to capture their CO2, they can just uh, sell it into the, sink, into the storage thing that uh, is there. This is some work, uh, the Great Plains Institute, that identified uh, certain uh, um, places for hubs. Um, I think on the next slide I'll talk about one in Houston here. It's probably the biggest one being talked about. Uh, I talked a little about the ethanol plants in the Midwest uh, taking the uh, CO2 into North Dakota. This is the Bakken. The Bakken's were, it's actually, North Dakota is actually the second largest oil producing state in the country now. Uh, and that's because of the, uh, all the shale oil, I'm sorry, the shale gas, oh, both shale gas and shale oil that they have in the uh, Bakken. So, the, yeah, I already mentioned the second bullet on this slide. So Exxon Mobil is actually um, leading a hub in the uh, Houston area, and they ha they have at least a dozen other major companies that have signed on to it, and they have a goal of trying to do uh, get up to 100 million tons a year uh, through this hub. The Summit uh, Carbon Solutions. Uh, in the Midwest one that I talked about, is looking at uh, trying to do about 5 million tons of CO2 a year. So, uh, uh, as I said, the uh, Summit Carbon Solutions, uh, as soon as they get their permits for the pipeline, uh, will really implement it. They, have, uh, they basically have all the ethylene plant, uh, ethanol plants uh, lined up uh, to go. Other hubs... Uh, I, I, once again, I mentioned throughout uh, money in the bills for hydrogen hubs, and uh, at least one of those hydrogen hubs will have what they call blue hydrogen, which is um, methane reforming with uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, we're going to have direct air capture hubs. Uh, uh, there's, uh, for each of these, there's about $3.5 billion uh, in the bills. That's significant money. Um, both of the um, proposals have gone in for both the hydrogen hubs and the direct air capture hubs. Uh, the supposition is the Department of Energy will want to um, award them this fiscal year. The government fiscal year is the end of September. If they want to award them by the end of September, if they want to get them in place by the end of September, government procurement, especially on things this big, will take at least a couple months. So we could see... Um, we could see the awards coming out uh, uh, sometime uh, in July. Um, I would not be surprised, but then again, you never know with the government uh, if they can keep the schedule. But they, they, um, they feel some urgency to get these uh, monies out um, while, the, while the money's there to be given. So I'm just going to finish with uh, uh, some closing thoughts, and then I'll take any questions. Uh, final questions. So um, things have changed with carbon capture over the, the last three decades. Uh, uh, you know, it, it originally was looked at something put on a coal plant, but the applications have greatly expanded. Uh, the number of people involved, the amount of money involved has greatly increased, and I think uh, the recognition of the need for it has really uh, increased also. Um, the energy transition is going to really make our energy systems look different from what it's looked in the past. And today we still look more like what we looked in the past than we're going to need in the future. And so when you look at what's needed for carbon capture technology and also combustion in general, it needs to fit in with what tomorrow's systems are going to look like. No one knows exactly what they're going to look like but they will look different than today. And I think the innovators that can 
foresee what those systems look like, uh, uh, will be the leaders in uh, developing the technology for it. Uh, today, negative emissions are a hot topic. As I said, I think we have to pump the brakes a little. I think uh, negative emissions are going to be very important down the line, but I think the most important thing today is to reduce, um, reduce emissions and uh, carbon capture uh, can play a major role in that. And, you know, there's always going to be room to improve cost, uh, but it's always going to be cheaper to put CO2 in the atmosphere than to capture and put it in the ground. Therefore, you know, we're really going to need policy to make it economically viable. Uh, we're going to need policy. I showed you the graphs of how we're doing uh, uh, on displacing fossil fuels. We're going to really need policy to accelerate that. Um, we've had a start with some of the bills last year. Uh, you know, there's been projections, uh, including uh, uh, there was a major study, uh, including a, a, a major study here at Princeton. Um, one of the uh, former people I knew at MIT, who's now a professor here, Jesse Jenkins, was one of the leaders of that. And, uh, you know, they're saying that um, uh, by 2030, maybe we'll, we'll have cut our emissions 40 percent from 2005. The, the goal was to cut it 50 percent. So even we're not that aggressive, you know, and then get it down to net zero emissions by 2050. But maybe uh, that bill will get us um, a, a ways there, but we're still going to need much stronger policy uh, coming in the future, and hopefully our politics in the country will allow that to happen. So I'm just going to leave it there and happy to answer questions on anything from the course or anything else dealing with climate change, carbon capture, et cetera. Thank you. And I thank you for listening to me for six hours. <laughs> yes? Uh, my question, like based on your talk, it sounds like cost will always be a difficult pill to swallow in terms of the carbon capture and storage. I mean, I co wonder... yeah, cost is a difficult thing for decarbonization. Yeah. And the reason is um, fossil fuels have some negative implications, but they're really a great energy source. I mean, just think of an automobile. You have so much energy in that gas tank, and when you need to fill up your gas tank, in less than five, five uh, minutes, you have another range of four or 500 miles. It's, it's such a great fuel, and that's why things are having a hard time coming in. And as I also showed, we have plenty of fossil fuels left. So unless, you know, you have to make using fossil fuels more expensive to make other things economical. The government cannot pay for subsidizing all these other things. So, you know, that's the problem. We're going to have to actually leave fossil fuels in the ground um, to solve climate change, and that's not an easy thing to do. And people have to be convinced it's a necessary thing to do, and we're not quite there. So it, cost, yeah, I mean, cost is the way we do things in our economy, but the underlying issue, it goes beyond just cost. It's, you know, it, it's what, what isn't taken into account is the cost of the CO2 emissions we get from burning fossil fuels. And we put it in the atmosphere for free today, where really it isn't free. People are paying the cost of that. My sisters are paying the cost of that with increased uh, insurance costs in Florida right now. We're all going to be paying the cost of it uh, going forward. So um, there was, <laughs> I actually looked this up on the internet recently. Um, in 1992, there was a commercial for Fram oil filters. So uh, it may be before most of you were born, but, uh, uh, and you can look it up on the internet. Uh, 
And so the, as a mechanic under a car, basically fixing an engine, and he shows an oil filter, says, you know, this whole, all could have been prevented by paying $5 for this oil filter. Now we're doing, replacing the engine for hundreds of dollars. He says, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And that's, that's where we are with, cli you know, with, with climate change. You can pay them now or pay later. And uh, unfortunately, well, and when you pay later, it costs a lot more than paying now. Yes? Uh, one, let, uh, let me. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for my hearing, but <laughs> I can't do much. Of, well, I have hearing aids, but still they're limited. <laughs> oh, people have looked at it. I, you know, I learned never to say never, but I think it's. Mm, it's probably not practical. I mean, you can find some articles in there, um, but it, you know, this you have to swap out. The, you, you know, you could probably capture it and swap it out, but then you have a lot of more weight in the vehicle, and it, it just doesn't seem practical to me uh, to do that. It's much better to either decarbonize the fuel by using electricity or hydrogen, or um, you know, for certain things to offset it, so, yeah. But people are talking about doing it on ships, um, and there actually are some pilot projects on ships right now, um, and you can maybe see it also, well, trains, though, they can electrify, but certain trains, things where you have the space and the, uh, you can take the space and the weight, uh, you can maybe do it, but not, not on the personal automobile, I don't think. People are trying and people will continue to try, but <laughs> we'll see. Other questions? Yes? Um, what do you think are the problems? Well, let, let me come so up there, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what do you think are the chances that like, we are kind of paying now and doing something instead of later because scientists, I think, have been talking about this since Yeah. That's that's the million dollar question. What what's it going to take for people to really, you know, get up and and do something? What we do see people doing. We do see people doing adaptation, um, which now you're going to have to have a mix of um, of both mitigation and ad adaptation. And we see people doing that because it's right in their face. So if, you, if you're in a place where you see increased flooding, you're going to do flood prevention. Uh, you know, and you know, you're not going to question why. I, you, know, you just say, I have to do this, and, and it's immediate. The problem with, with climate change is it's not always immediate, even though it's getting more so. And it's also diffuse. So, if you spend money on mitigation, it's not just helping me reduce the, the problems of climate change, it's helping everybody. So to make that really work, it's everybody has to contribute a little to mitigation and we all benefit. Adaptation is more selfish. You do it on a local level and, and the, you know, the local people pay and then the local people uh, benefit. Um, so that's a little easier psychologically. but. You know, climate it, it, it's If you look at uh, uh, the problem of climate change, it's one of the hardest things for humans to grapple with. It's not what we do. And so, uh, you know, part of it's going to be a education, um, but you're not going to be able to, the type of changes you need uh, to, to transform the, um, you know, the, the, the energy systems, um, you're really going to need the political will, so you really need a lot of people on your side. Now, I think we can transform the energy systems over 100, 150 years without a lot of strong policy, but we don't have 100, 150 years, so we need to really compress it um, down. That, and, and that's the challenge. So, you know, um, there's a lot, you know, 
I work more on the technology. Obviously, I, I follow the policy, but um, you know, it's it's you know, you, you can't get down. You just have to keep working on it. And, and you know, I think you know we're making progress, but just just too slow. Other questions? Okay, let me let me let me come down and get closer. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, I well, I think there are enough mature technologies that we can implement a lot of projects today, <clears throat> and that technology will get better. Um, and also, there may be new ways to do it, that what's immature are alternatives to say amines. Um, but, but the amines are good enough um, uh, today. What is immature is the supply chain. So, um, you know, if, you know, there's just not enough, you know, if someone's going to make these absorbers, okay, you know, uh, if a company's going to make them, they don't really want to go into business just to make one. But if they know they're going to get an order of 100 of them, then you'll see the supply chain uh, gear up. So that's, that's what I think um, is immature, is, is, is that part of it. But I think the fundamental technology is good enough to get going. So, um, and uh, we'll just see, you know, the other problem with the, well, I won't say pro, I mean, the other challenge of carbon capture versus, say, something like uh, renewables is, you know, a lot of this, you're going to put in a, 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 a thing at a power plant for a million or two million tons a year. That's a billion, you know, you're talking billion dollars and, or multi-billion dollars. You can do a renewables project much easier on a much smaller scale. Of course, you're not going to get the, the two million tons from that one project, but the risk of, of a single renewables project is a lot less th than the risk there. And so that's, and, and I think the high capital cost uh, in, in today's um, financial environment is a bit of a, a, of a thing. But, you know, all of these things can be overcome if there's a will, and, and, and that's the bottom line. I, I feel amazed that there's so many projects and so many things going on despite these barriers. Um, I think um, you can really see an explosion once um, some of these things are solved. So I think we'll see how this, uh, all these things come from the, uh, the infrastructure buildup. If the infrastructure gets there, it starts really eliminating some of the barriers. So, so I have some optimism there. Other questions? Okay, well, I want to thank you. Nice to meet everyone, and uh, uh, good luck in your careers as you move forward, and uh, that's it. <laughs>